Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another wonderful Sunday Night Thrive, and I'm really glad you could make it. Super blessed that we get this time together. Let's go to Lord in prayer, and let's jump right in. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of being able to seek your face tonight. Thank you, you are a God we can call upon greatly to be praised. And we pray, Lord, that you would be blessed by our offering tonight of praise and the study of your word. just commit this time to you and pray. Redeem every second of it, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Thank you, Lord by our offering tonight, I pray. Thank you, God, that you are a God greatly to be praised, worthy of more praise and honor than we'll ever give you. And God, we pray that tonight you would meet us right where we're at and draw us deeper into you as we study your word now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, beloved, grab your Bibles. Hello again. I would say tonight as I would any, please never just believe me. Never just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible have the final say. Or as I would say, don't take my word for it. Take the word for it. Yeah, that's it. All right. We are in, and I'll drop this down a little bit, I think. There we go. We are in the book of Leviticus, chapter 2. And uh, Father, just again, anoint me with your Holy Spirit. Come upon me so that they, that we all, that they would see you tonight and encounter you. And Lord, empower me by the power of your Holy Spirit. Work through me. Do great work tonight. Meet us right where we're at and draw us into this amazingly beautiful place with you as we commit this to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Grain is the issue tonight as we are in the uh, book of Leviticus, the second of the five in order mentioned specific sacrifices in the manner to approach God. And it's important to recognize what grain meant to us. We were, in essence, farmers. So grain meant a lot. It meant, well, it reminded us of the fall because of the hard work that we needed to put into it as God reminded us that, uh, or at least spoke to us and told us that, that this was going to be work and it was going to produce in this toil and hard work and exhausting efforts. It was going to produce thorns and thistles and we had to work beyond it to get to that thing we could live off of, the fruit that would live off of it. That once was just readily ripe and ready for our picking, but now with the fall, that's different. So we're reminded of the fall, but also it actually challenges us in regards to the area of faith, because no matter how great of a, of a farmer we are, without heaven's rain, we're really still stuck with just a bunch of seeds. And it reminds us of God's mercy and judgment and to trust him in it. It also reminds us of forgiveness in the sense that it is the setting for Joseph's restoration. Uh, ultimately, if you remember Joseph sold by his brothers into Egypt, but God, is, God used grain to save a Gentile nation, Egypt, but then to restore Joseph to his brothers in that order, which in essence is really the situation of Jesus' first coming versus his second, if you will. Uh, and then the faithfulness of our the required in, as we look to the future. Every a.m. and p.m. sacrifice involved the grain, but also in that, with each of the, with the grain, we ate some, we sold some, and we kept some for next year. And we had to really look to the future and say, how much of this am I expecting to plant? How much of this should I sell? How much of this should I just simply eat? And I remind you, it's Jesus who says in John 5, 39, you search the scriptures thinking by them you possess eternal life, but these are they that testify about me. So as I look at this, the volume of the book, I am looking for Jesus. Leviticus 2, 1 starts with this. And by the way, it's going to be rich in metaphor. And for those who think that God isn't a God who uses metaphors, you should just try to read Matthew 13, where seven different times God busts out the simile of a king, the kingdom of heaven is like. And he compares then one thing to another, parabola, the word parable, para meaning beside, bale or balo meaning to throw, to throw beside. Well, here God is going to use rich metaphors to bring us into this beautiful illustration of a grain offering. And it says again in verse 1, when anyone offers a grain offering, mincha korban, by the way, mincha is still used today of the middle of the three times of prayer, that noontime. When anyone offers a grain offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, one of whom shall take from it uh, his handful of fine flour, oil, uh, with all of the frankincense, Excuse me, and the priest shall burn it as a memorial, <clears throat> excuse me, on the altar, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is most holy of the offerings to the Lord made by fire. So God really kind of gives us the overarching here, this milcha korban, this gift of or offering of dedicated to God from uh, the grain. It, from the from the get-go, it is offered to the Lord and yet will bless those who serve him. And I want to say that again, that this mincha, this gift, this offering to God of our own free will offering, the two things God basically established with the first of the offerings, because this is the second in, in order, is that it had to be perfect and it had to be done willingly. Now in this, as we offer this, we offer it to the Lord, but that which we offer to the Lord will ultimately wind up blessing those who serve him. And we saw that by verse three. It is offered with the, uh, with the burnt offering, Numbers 28 and 29, we'll make that clear with the peace offering, in Leviticus 7, Numbers 15 will tell us. It is offered with the, at the end of a Nazarite vow in Numbers 6, and when a leper is cleansed in Leviticus 14. It is a very fundamental thing. And this is how the chapter basically goes. Verses 1 to 3, the bare grain offering. Uh, verses 4 to 11, it being prepared, baked in whatever manner. And there are several different ways we'll, we'll see. And then finally in 12 to 16, the first fruits. Now the order is imperative. This is the second, I remind you, of the offerings. Because this can only be offered after the burnt offering is defined. 
I offer the work of my hands after the total surrender of the substitutionary perfect sacrifice that I saw in chapter one. In the same way, any of my offerings that I offer to God that are the work of my hands before I seek to be made right by God or as as in offering to be made right with God are not going to work. And so God has made that essential. It starts with me laying my hands, taking, if you will, personal possession of my own sin, laying it upon a perfect sacrifice, confessing it upon them, and then watching that thing die in my place. Of course, the perfect precursor for Jesus. So the three requirements we saw in our first few verses, first of all, it has to be a flower because it has to be of grain if it's going to be a grain offering. That's kind of the no-brainer. The other two things that we see here is that it has to have oil. Uh, verses 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 15, and 16 all mention oil in this. And the other thing is it requires to have frankincense. Verses 1, 2, 15, and 16 all make that clear. Now, this is where we start to dive into things from a biblical perspective of where these things are mentioned. Uh, oil, of course, it's mentioned 204 times, so we can't develop all of those, but we'll I'll cover some sort of milestones, some landmarks. Uh, God in Psalm 89, in the simplest sense, speaks about holy anointing his holy one. Uh, in 133, when we read, uh, Behold how good and how precious or blessing or beneficial it is or pleasant for the brothers to dwell together in unity. It says it's like the precious oil upon the head of Aaron, the high priest. Uh, and of course, we'll see that anointing going upon Saul and upon David as well. So oil empowers it's important to recognize the oil placed upon someone spoke of empowering them, granting them some form of kratos, some form of authority or position or empowerment for that type of thing. Oil also refreshed. Uh, Psalm 23 verse 5, where you see the, the Jesus, the Lord, our shepherd, says, you anoint my head with oil. In Psalm 45 verse 7, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. Or, in, for, for instance, in Psalm 104, verse 5, oil is what makes the face shine. It brings refreshment. So, oil empowered, oil refreshed, but oil also sustained and healed. David would say, in the depths of, his, of the fallout from his own uh, moral failures, in Psalm 51, verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Anoint my head with oil. This issue of, as a vehicle to bring healing. Uh, Luke 10 verse 34, the Samaritan, when seeing the man beat on his way to Jericho, he poured oil on him and covered his wounds with wine. Uh, James 5 verse 14, where it talks about if you're unwell to call for the elders and they anoint your head with oil and pray. Uh, and all of that said, it's important to note that this, this oil that we see even here speaks of that which empowered, refreshed, and healed or sustained. Now, when we look at the broader spectrum of oil, we see that metaphor being brought to pull into its proper driveway when we realize in 1 Samuel, when, for instance, Sam took that horn of oil and anointed Saul. It says that he anointed him and the Holy Spirit came upon him from that point forward. So I get the idea here that God is paralleling these. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. In Zechariah 4, of course, we're told in verse 6, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God speaks of his anointing and that oil as a, an emblem for his Holy Spirit. And this is my conclusion on this thing that is required for all of this grain or the work of my hands is that God, what I offer is what the Lord himself has empowered me, refreshed me and sustained me in to offer. I don't offer anything in my own strength, but rather what I offer unto the Lord is the very fruit of what he has done through me. But then there's also the requirement of frankincense. Now, of course, for us, the first place we would go, of course, is Matthew chapter 2 in regards to the wise men laying frankincense. But what else do we know about frankincense from Scripture? 
Song of Solomon mentions it the most, by the way. In chapter 3, verse 6, it is a perfume used in intimacy. In Song of Solomon 4.10, how much better than wine is your love and the scent of your perfumes than all spices. Love, love, love. Even manipulated and imitated by the adulteress and the, the, the dangerous coochie cooch flirt in Proverbs 20, and I'm sorry, 7.17, when she says then to draw in her next, uh, her next haul. She says, I have perfumed my bed with frankincense. And yet, the cry out to God is that may my prayer be set before you as incense uh, in Psalm 141, verse 12. And I recognize this, that frankincense testifies of or hints at this issue of intimacy and love. And this is why when we get to Numbers chapter 5, that when there is an offering made for jealousy, neither one of those things are added. Grain is, but there is no frankincense or oil offered. And it says, because it is to bring to remembrance iniquity. And so get the idea here that God has no intent for his Holy Spirit to be constantly reminding us of something Jesus has forgiven. But rather, it is... He, the Holy Spirit is to lead us forward. He is to remind us what Jesus has said about cleansing us from that iniquity. But also, our, my cry of in, 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 in accusation in jealousy, there is no intimacy in jealousy that coincide. So the conclusion, frankincense, done in love with a heart ignited by intimacy. And you know, it is amazing how when intimacy thrives in a relationship, how that inspires great things versus doing even those same things, but to try to obtain intimacy or to try to obtain favor. And in which case, the, the, the attention will be given to the results more than the sheer pleasure of being able to perform this because there's no result needed because the intimacy is already there. And you watch both happen. You watch people in relationships where they try so hard to try to win over somebody that should already be won over in many cases. And their efforts are always with this hard, intensive, prescribed analysis of the reaction with the idea that is this, is it getting what I'm really wanting out of this? And of course, the obvious problem with that is, I'm doing it for an, intend, for an intended end versus out of the sheer delight of the fact that I already am enjoying this individual. And you watch that. And so the sum conclusion of making sure that, that all of these offerings are done with oil and with frankincense is that I offer to God the fruit of my hands by what God has done through me, ignited by love, driven to see those things done. As Philippians 2.13 says, it is God who works within us both to will to do and to do for his good pleasure. And I ask as we start this now in my own inventory, how much of what I do is done still with the intent of gaining God's favor with where it's more like I'm initiating hoping God will respond versus I'm responding because God is initiating. Because if I do it the first way, it doesn't bless God and it only tires me out and that'll be the case in any relationship where you just are fighting to get something like intimacy or closeness or whatever the case would be. And you're trying to do it through some form of works. Well, verse four. Now we start to get into sort of specifics of the ways these things could be offered. Verse four, it says that if you bring an offering, a grain offering baked in an oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. So you can offer crackers to God if you wish, uh, unrisen biscuits for those of us across the, the way. Uh, verse 5, if your offering is a grain offering baked in a pan, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces, pour oil on it. It's a grain offering. So you can offer God pancakes, if you will. That's sort of the idea, as long as they're not risen. Unleavened pancakes, of course. Verse 7, if your offering is a grain offering baked in a covered pan, it shall be made of fine flour 
with oil. And I go, hmm, well, we went from sort of pancakes for the priests to grain casserole for the Kohen. And in all of these things, the idea of it is, is in, and, and, and it's something I don't want us to miss. God is going to make clear that there are certain things you cannot add to this mix that are not allowed in this recipe. And it begs to consider that that doesn't mean you can't add things to this recipe. It just means you can't add things God told you you can't add to them. And the only reason I say that is, is God says these things must be included in it. These things cannot be included in it. No, have at it. And that makes so much sense to me when he's like, God's like, well, if you want to bake it or make a pancake out of it, or you want to bake it and cover it, you know, in a covered pan, whatever the case is. And, and imagine, if you will, you're wanting to bless God. And what you're going to do is you're going to bring this to the priests. And a part of it's going to be then thrown on the fire and is to say, God is so blessed by this. And yet the rest of it gets to be a blessing for the priests. And their family, the idea of giving this the work of your hands with the benefit of blessing those in service to them, what a sweet thing that is. So I could say that if I were a priest, man, have at it. Get creative. Bake it in all kinds of ways. Just make sure it's got oil. Make sure it's got some frankincense on there. Uh, and we're going to see that there'll be another thing added here in a moment and a couple of things required for that not to be the case. Uh, look at verse 8. You shall bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord. And when it's presented to the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. Then the priest shall take from the grain offering a memorial portion, burn it on the altar. It is an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. What is left of the grain offering shall be Aaron and his sons. It is most holy of the offerings to the Lord made by fire. Now look at the beauty in this. God wants to make sure that those who serve him are cared for. And the way that he does it is by blessing the work of your hands and then giving you the blessing of being a part of the solution by bringing that as an offering to God so that God can then use it to support those who serve him. What a cool setup. Now, God could have just sort of had it rain manna for the priests and such, but the idea of a community where people who are now being blessed in their service because God is working through them and blessing them are able to now be a blessing to others. In the end of all of this, every person involved is being a blessing. Did you get that? First of all, they're being blessed like the, the people who are not priests here. They're being blessed by a harvest and that harvest then is able to be offered to God. A part of it is offered to God in a free will offering. And that part that is offered to God turns to bless the priest, which means then this person's blessed by God with a harvest and then a blessing to the priest in their offering. The priest receives this blessing and is blessed by those who are offering these gifts, but then also is serving and gets to be a blessing to those they serve by being the priest in their role and functioning in the role that God has ordained them. So in both cases, the people are blessed and a blessing. And in God's economy, he wants every person blessed and he wants every person blessing. And sometimes we live in a world where we're more like, I just want to be blessed. And God's like, but you don't even, even know how beautiful it is to be blessed by being a blessing. And God says, I'm ordaining that in this. And it is most holy because it is in the hands of the priest, it is experiencing the presence of God. And when I offer it to God, God is not only the only one blessed, but those who serve him are as well. All right, let's get back to the deep metaphor. Beautiful. Verse 11. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven nor any honey or any offering to, on in any offering to the Lord made by fire. Two things forbidden from the recipe. You can. It doesn't say you couldn't add another cup of grain or figs or whatever the case. We don't read any of that, but we do read here is that there are two things you cannot add to this recipe. And the first is leaven. Now, 
For those of us who have studied the word for any period of time, usually this is a common and an easy one because we recognize how many times in scripture leaven refers to sin in whatever manner. The kingdom of heaven like a woman who hid the leaven in three measures of meal. Matthew 13, verse 33, which we'll see later on as these offerings are developed, is the offering of a grain offering. Uh, Matthew 16, verse 6, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which we'll see there is the doctrine. But in Luke 12, 1, the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 6 through 8, we read about the leaven of malice and of wickedness, but rather serving and offering to God the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And we are warned that leaven is a contagion, an infectant, versus a disinfectant, and it tends to be the dominant gene in the situation. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, Galatians 5, 4, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. But leaven, yeast, in its simplest sense, is a decaying agent. What it does is it starts to erode and decay, and as it decays, it fills this little thing with air, so it looks bigger, but it's full now of air emptiness and sin is such a well i should say this way leaven is such a perfect metaphor for sin in that sense that sin decays and it wages war on life it erodes it infects and makes things look bigger but in the end of it all all they're full of is nothingness and god says i never want you to offer anything i've done through your hands I never want you to offer any of the stuff that I've done through you and offer it in any way that's with sin involved in it. In other words, I'm not, you know, and how could that happen? Well, think it through. I'm offering something to out-offer the person next to me, to spite a person for it. I'm offering something out of pride. There's so much that can be done that, that even in a contemporary church setting we see. People trying to out-sing, out-tongue, out-prophesy, out-dance. There's so much, and we'll see that that plays on with the honey thing here in a moment. But the idea, God's like, don't expect for a moment that with what you're offering is riddled with sin, that I'm going to be blessed by it. And we even see that when we read about offering your your gift on the altar and then realizes your brother has something against you. He goes, go get right with them. Because remember, our offerings were ultimately to bless God, but also those who serve him. And in, in this, God wants to make sure for each of us that if we want to hate each other, our offerings mean little to nothing. Because God first wants to make sure that our grandiose actions of great bravado mean nothing in the light of our obsequient attention to ignore and be negligent to the people around us, or worse, to be malicious to the people around us. God's like, that is not allowable. But the second thing is, it's also not to have honey. In Proverbs 5, 3, the lips of an immoral woman drip honey. In Proverbs 25, 27, and this is the verse that stands out the most. The first thing that comes to my mind as I read this, it's not good to eat much honey. So to seek one's own glory is not glory. In the parallel poetry of Proverbs 25, eating much honey is up with seeking one's glory. And the idea of this pride and self-exaltation and this self-centeredness, God lays out and says, I don't want that in my offering either. And that makes perfect sense to me. Because if I'm offering to God, the, the intent is to bless him in gratitude for what he's already done, or I wouldn't have anything to offer him in the first place. And God says, don't play games with me of just trying to do this so that you, you're you doing this as like playing the lottery. God, if I give you enough of this, give me those seven numbers. There's a billion in the balance here. And you get the idea here that God's like, I know when you're playing me for a different end. Then, and God wants to be the end of the search, not the means to it. Well. Wow. And I ask, how much of my offering as, as a songwriter and as a worshiper and as a servant and a teacher, how much of it is offering with honey versus being offered for the blessing of you and for the blessing of God? Because that's really what matters, isn't it? Well, because all the other stuff is going to not work anyways. All right, 
our last few verses. Verse 12, as for the offering of the first fruits, you shall offer them to the Lord, but they shall not be burned on the altar for a sweet aroma. Unique to this one is that this one, because it's first fruits, is not to be burned, but rather just to be enjoyed. But I get that because Romans eleven sixteen tells us if the first fruit's holy, the lump is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And we read then what that first fruit is when we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Christ is risen from the dead, becoming the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And I love this idea here because every person that served and lived as these things were written, they understood this perfectly. They knew that when they offered the first fruits to the Lord, what they did is as they started to see the beginning of a harvest They would take the very best. And as they would take the very best, they would want to offer that to God and say, as this hint of this harvest is, may the whole harvest be. I don't want any of it janky or wonky or nasty or any of that. I want it all to be that. And and I realized that when God says, well, let's take a look at the first fruits, the first fruits of the harvest from death is Jesus himself. I'm like, oh, may the whole harvest be like that. And he says, look, take that and just bring it to be a a blessing. And here's our last ingredient. Not only was it to have oil and frankincense, but verse 13. And every one of you, uh, I'm sorry, and every offering, I'm sorry, of your grain offering, you shall season with salt. There is no offering to be made without it here. Uh, And it says, you shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. One thing God says across the board is that if it's going to be offered, it needs to be salted. Why is that so important to God? What does salt mean to him? Well, if he builds on this idea here, we'll see the covenant of salt in Numbers 18, 19. We'll see Elijah putting salt at the source of the water in 2 Kings 2. But he uses this issue of the covenant of salt as well, for instance, in 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 13, verse 5. He speaks of it of what he's made salt to be. And that is a lasting agent, a preservative, something that is transcending versus transitive. And that is imperative for us to recognize that the idea of a covenant of salt is, and listen, a covenant of salt forever is what he tells us in Numbers 18, verse 19. God wants us to see eternity in salt. The idea of something that will outlive us, that will outlast us, and even benefit us in that sense. To this day, well, I shouldn't say it that way because they're really, they're not mummifying anymore. But to this day, when you look at, uh, we, we were just at the Getty Villa, uh, which is a place you can visit. It's an art gallery, but they have a mummy there. And they, again, walk you through how a person is mummified. And one of the first things that happens is how they are, once the organs are removed and such, how they are encased in salt. And the idea of it sort of pulling out the moisture and bringing in this preservative. And this is why often you can pay, for instance, this, the Roman soldiers were paid with salt because it helped their meat last and such. And as a matter of fact, the term salary comes from the term from salt. Now, when I recognize that I look at this thing and it says, God has always intended for me to have a mind that transcends the moment, I get the idea why Jesus would say in Matthew 5, 14, or 13, 5, 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. And the idea of it is that we are really the thing that God is using to keep this world sustained and to keep it from completely eroding. And I love that because the world is even morally under the laws of entropy, under the law of entropy. And we are the one thing being renewed daily in our walk with the Lord. And we are the one thing that's seeking to to remove that effect, but rather to draw people deeper into the place where the God that never ages In Colossians chapter 4, and many of us are familiar with this verse, but consider it in light of that with salt. Verse 6, let your speech always be seasoned with salt. And I love this. 
full, full of grace, which means it's a gift to others. Could you imagine it's like if every time I opened my mouth, it was a gift to somebody and it was seasoned with salt that I know, may know how or I may know how to answer each one. That every time I spoke, eternity resonated with what I spoke. Could you imagine? And God's like, I never want you to detach even for a moment from your eternal perspective because God's salvation is more than just keeping you from the common cold. The wounds that Jesus experienced that, that Isaiah speaks of in Isaiah 53 are completely interwoven into the context of our salvation, not just our being removed from any discomforts or any of the malaises of the world we live in. Because ultimately, sooner or later, these shells will be cashed in. But the great news is that we'll stand before God. We will stand before God and eternity is engaged. And that's when it really matters. And that's where our deliverance is fundamental and essential. Well, with that in mind, there is no offering that I give to God that is simply with the idea of something temporary in mind because I worship a holy God. And as I worship a holy God, I want to be able to say, Lord of heaven and earth, God of eternity, infinite, almighty, everlasting, I offer you this as a blessing to you. Well, so um, I'll wrap it up here in a moment. Let's get those last few verses. Verse 14, if you offer a grain offering of your first fruits to the Lord, and there's our first fruits again, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first fruits green heads of grain roasted on the fire, grain beaten from full heads. And you shall put oil on it. And in other words, you're giving the, the part that's actually the wheat and not the chaff, for instance, or the part that's the barley and not the, not the part that you're not eating. You're, in other words, you're offering the good part, not the part that nobody wants. But then it's the same thing with the animals, right? Don't give me your nasty old thing that's just about to die anyways. It's the thing, if it's going to be for sin, for instance, it needs to be something that has no defect. And it says you should put oil on it, lay frankincense on it, because it's a grain offering. And the priest shall burn the memorial portion, part of it beaten grain, a part with its oil, with all of the frankincense as an offering made by fire to the Lord. And there's so much more I want to develop, but for the sake of time, let me say this. This is what we offer. First, we deal with the total sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is the first offering, the burnt offering. And now I offer that which is done, one by God's Spirit, two out of love and intimacy, three attached to eternity, without the semblance of sin and pride and personal aggrandizement. Those things cannot be allowed in the offering. Uh, Colossians 3.17, whatever we do in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And I think, what could I offer God today? And what would God do with it? If I could offer whatever skill, whatever talent, whatever thing that God has endowed me with, could I offer it in such a way that I know that God's going to say, well, then let's bless somebody else with it. That I'd say, great, that's what I was hoping for. Because it has to be free from my glory, but rather with the attention for his. And therefore, Jesus would tell us in Matthew 6, if I do my charitable deeds or if I pray, when I do my charitable deeds, when I pray, when I fast, not to do it with the idea of getting exalted by man, but rather I'm to do it in a way that God sees and not man. So that ultimately, God would be blessed. God's people would be blessed, but I wouldn't be exalted for it. By God's spirit, out of love and intimacy with the Father, with a view to my eternal redemption, Jesus offered himself up for my sin and forfeited his glory for my shame. Jesus would say in regards to grain, as we bring this to close, in John 12, verses 23 and 24, unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and dies, it remains alone. And Jesus, first and foremost, speaking about his own mortal coil casing for which the Godhood would be clothed in, 
would be crucified, thrown in the ground. But I look at that and I see the application as well in my own life as a husband, as a father, as a servant of the Lord. If I'm busy saving my life, I'll remain alone in it. And in each of these cases, Jesus knew that that grain that is thrown into the ground ceases to be grain, but instead rises up to be that which produces infinitely more, 30, 60, 100 fold more grain as a result of it. And the same thing happens in my own personal surrender to the living God, yours as well. That as I offer that, God does great stuff through me. And as he does great stuff through me and you as well, that we offer that to the Lord and say, well then Lord, whatever it is you're doing through me, use it to bless you and bless those who love you because God, that's what you intend. So may I offer that. So as we conclude this second sacrifice, Tonight, my prayer is the Lord would speak to each of us who have surrendered to the living God and say, God, use me, but use me in a way that blesses you and blesses your own. And if you've not accepted the gift of Jesus, please hear me again. Just like grain that God invented to show us, this thing comes to the ground and dies so that it could produce life for so many others. Jesus did the same taking your sins and mine upon himself, suffered and died just as God promised, buried in the, just as God promised in his scriptures, and then rose again the third day to offer us new life. And if you haven't accepted that gift, man, now is the time, don't you think? Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful time and the way that you've spoken to us. And I pray tonight, Lord, that we would be drawn closer to you. And Lord, that our hands would be your hands to be used. That you would work through us by the power of your spirit. And out of love for you in response to the love you've poured into our hearts. Do fantastic things through us that would bless you and would edify others. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to you and say, use us. Even now, Lord, prepare us for that. And if there be any tonight who have yet to say yes to Jesus, and you know it, then pray with me right now, would you? God in heaven, I agree. I confess I'm a sinner. But you've punished my sin on the shoulders of Jesus, who died on that cross for me, so that all the crimes of my heart could be punished, died, buried, rose again, just as your scripture promised, so that I could have new life, that I could leave the old me behind, buried with Jesus, and be raised in the newness of life to grant life to others. Oh, so Lord Jesus, receive me now as I hand you my life, confessing you as my Redeemer and as my Savior. I am yours. Jesus, in your name I pray. And if you agree, I ask you to say, Amen. Well, that was fun, don't you think? Well, let's end with a song, shall we? If you've prayed that prayer tonight, I would love the honor of being able to speak with you about it. And we will leave at the end of this a an email address. I'm so, yeah, so that you can uh, leave us any prayer requests or just let me know, hey, I've given my life to Jesus. In which case, I would love then to be able to give you some tools and help walk you forward. And, you know, the kind of stuff we all really need.
take this heart It's only yours to take Take this life And use it for your glory Every breath of my days Oh, oh, oh Every breath of my days Father God I come into your temple by your majesty Holy One I bow before you altar as I bring this offering so take this mind and go be in your presence take this heart it's only Oh, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for another beautiful night. Thank you for my friends who have tuned in. Bless us tonight, we pray, and be blessed with our offering of ourselves to you and these hands. Use them for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, beloved. I look forward to seeing you next week.